Hello and welcome to Who Needs Western Civ, a podcast about liberal arts and classical education. I'm Clay Green, and today I'm joined by Alex Priu. Alex Priu is a philosopher. He teaches in the Herps Program for Engineering, Ethics, and Society at the University of Colorado Boulder and serves as a faculty fellow in the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization. Is the author of three books, Becoming Socrates, Defending Socrates, and Musings on Plato's Symposium. He has shared his wisdom with the general public on the weekly podcast, The New Thinkery. Uh, today, I want to talk with him about a secondary interest of his, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Thank you for being on the podcast, Alex. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Clay. Nice to, nice to talk to you. So um, I'm grateful to have you here because... Uh, on the New Thinkery, a few times I've heard you mention Nietzsche, and uh, it seems like you have some uh, deeper understanding of Nietzsche, certainly than I do. And whenever I find a student interested in philosophy, I almost invariably find that they have some interest or another in in Nietzsche. Why do you think it is that Nietzsche is especially attractive for students or for anyone for that matter? I think uh, when it comes to students, you know, for the young, um, there's a kind of a reverence uh, that they find attractive. Uh, he often says, you know, I'm willing to smash idols, test idols, but perhaps also smash them in the uh, process. It's kind of similar to what Socrates says in the Apology, where he says he goes around refuting people and uh, some of them very prominent people, he says, and uh, the young kind of take a keen interest in this. Um, it's interesting in the Republic, Socrates is more critical of this sort of thing uh, because there's a real danger there in exposing young people to too destructive critique of, of uh, sort of revered idols. Um, and I think Nietzsche exhibits that danger. And I would even go so far as to say he exploits that danger. He knows that this is, uh, um, this is something that young people uh, might really enjoy. Machiavelli does the same thing as well. I think it's a sort of tried and true philosophic tactic. Um, beyond the young, he was also, I think, writing for an audience uh, increasingly attracted to politics mm -hmm. over more intellectual uh, endeavors. Um, I think he sensed that liberalism was creeping over Germany uh, as well. Um, and so liberalism, which has its own tendency to smash uh, idols, um, he kind of exploits maybe the attraction to that, while also, and I think this is the crucial thing, combining it with an extremely high taste, exceedingly discriminating uh, taste. And so he appeals, I think, in a way to uneasy liberals or nascent liberals or people who um, might be inclined to give up old things, um, while also being something of a guilty pleasure, um, specifically the pleasure in being able to judge things, right? Um of having a healthy contempt, uh, or I, I would even call, call it a kind of salutary contempt for things that are low, um, that's based not in just a sort of old-fashioned reverence for the past, but in some kind of higher standard arrived at through your own sort of discerning uh, judgment. In that way, he kind of combines the critique of the old um, um, but in but sort of pushes it in a new direction. And so I think certainly for me, as I was young and, you know, sort of being inculcated in modern sort of society, I had a kind of displeasure with some of the things I was uh, seeing, right? Sort of pop culture things, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. And Alan Bloom, I think, speaks to that well in Closing the American Mind, but Nietzsche does it in, in a sort of... Uh, uh, sort of philosophic way that's I think has a lasting appeal uh, especially to people in our, our current age mm. thank you there are a couple areas I'd like to follow up there the first is um, when I think of Nietzsche smashing idols I think of him going after elements of conventional or religious morality and I find myself wondering if today's uh, if today we we have quite enough of that <laughs> for Nietzsche to be uh, to need that iconoclasm on Nietzsche's part. Do students have enough uh, in place that Nietzsche's 
attack is salutary. Yeah, I mean, you could say that our predicament, uh, which is is sort of Nietzsche saw coming and sought to avoid, uh, our predicament is that usually philosophers are in the uh, business of taking an existing education and morality and religion and trying to adapt it as far as possible to mm-hmm. the education of philosophers. That would be the ideal. Um, now, and we just had an episode with uh, Tim Burns of uh, Baylor University, but now, I mean, this issue came up. Now we seem to be in the position of needing to actually supply that education mm-hmm. or revive uh, that education. I would say that that the idea of smashing idols, which he then revises into a notion of testing idols, can actually be a kind of uh, source um of a newfound appreciation for the, I had no religious upbringing myself. And so I, I posed the Bible without uh sort of um, piety or without uh, animosity. Right. And I've come to de- you know, appreciate these texts very much for the wisdom they contain and the sensible sort of, uh, or, or uh, really sort of powerful alternative they offer. And so um if you're testing idols and they turn out to be sound in some way or not as easily smashed uh, as you uh, initially thought, um, I think there is a sort of constructive element mm. there. I know that's something you wanted to discuss later, so I'll hold off that there. Yeah, I think uh, I think we can dip a little bit into that to just bring up one small point. Well, it's not small, but a specific point. Um, I think of Nietzsche's relationship to uh, Jesus, which is, I think, very complicated. And it shows that he never quite relinquishes something that he criticizes. Maybe something like his relationship with Socrates would be similar, where um, he has a lot of objections, but they he seems to keep returning and returning um, as if there is something there that attracts him very much. Yeah, I think, and I think Nietzsche was well well aware of the fact that he had not fully overcome the history that he was criticizing, mm. uh, especially in the case of Socrates. I think he's painfully aware of that. I think the book on this is Beyond Good and Evil, which is specifically trying to arrive at a philosophy of the future. And immediately you're faced with the question in the preface of whether the philosophy of the future um, in not uh, fully uh, criticizing the past or not being able to fully reject the past might repeat some part of it. And so it begins in the preface with some remarks about Socrates and Plato, which he then abruptly sets aside. And then in the very last sections, he comes to something like the Socratic genius of the heart in the penultimate section. And then in the final section, something like a platonic reflection on the nature of writing. And I think Nietzsche is fully in control of this. He understands that this, this critical project or critical historiography in which he's engaging um, has to, at some point, um, be open to the possibility that the future may be found in a past possibility, which is, I think, one of the great gifts Nietzsche gives us is, is this example of somebody wrestling, genuinely wrestling with the figure at the heart of this, Socrates, in the first work he wrote to the very last, and acknowledging in his final written words on Socrates that Socrates may have understood everything he himself understood. That's an incredible humility on, on Nietzsche's part. That should be appreciated. So I'll, I'll just say this: so much of the destructiveness is on the surface that it's very mm-hmm. hard to see the constructiveness. But it's it's absolutely there that there's mm-hmm. a real standard being sought. Mm-hmm. So I'm struck thinking about the kind of education in classics that a person like Nietzsche had in the 19th century. Maybe Nietzsche especially. Um, being a very, very promising classical philologist, classical historian, what what should we think about Nietzsche's extraordinary classical education and how it compares to 
uh, our own education to the education of a modern PhD in philosophy. I think when you're saying that there's a constructive constructive element to his evaluation of the classical past, there was some hint of this that um, Nietzsche certainly knew whereof he spoke and where he offers criticism, it's it really does come from deeply substantiated knowledge. Yeah, I mean, we pale in comparison <laughs> to him and his yeah. education. Uh, certainly, uh, if there are people as educated as him today, which I sincerely doubt, um, they're never so educated at so young an age. Uh, I mean, personally, when I read Nietzsche, I often come away with this, this sort of profound feeling of my own <laughs> crippling mediocrity in relation to his uh, education. Um, that my education is deeply impoverished. And I think that's an important feeling to have, right? Um, though it can be, I think, really difficult to handle. Often I'm, I'm driven to sort of think about myself and and think about our own age in comparison to Glaucon and Plato's Republic. In book seven, he hears the philosopher's education. And at first he's hearing about things he himself has learned, like arithmetic and geometry, and then about things that have yet to be discovered and things he never could hope that, that Socrates says, you'd have to get the whole city to get behind this sort of education. And I think Glaucon's reaction um, is to turn his contempt for the Athenian democracy, for its sort of moral corruption, inward into a sort of self-hatred, uh, hatred of what Athens has made him and what he thinks he can never, uh, ever escape. He's kind of humiliated, which I think is too far. And it's easy looking at Nietzsche's references, his deep learning and and all the sources he's drawing from and in a very careful way. It's difficult to read it and not feel humiliated. Uh, though I think a better reaction would just be to approach it with, uh, instead of humiliation, just humility, right? <laughs> And to look at to look at um, his references and to chase them down. Uh, mm -hmm. The books are available. We have unprecedented digital access. I've been able to download works that Nietzsche implicitly uh, invokes, and uh, and read them uh, in the original and sort of work through it. Um, uh, to go and find these long forgotten books and to look up his sources. Um, to look at ancient sources that we often don't take seriously today, and I have in mind here really Diogenes Laertius. Um, in doing that, I think you can begin to engage with Nietzsche and follow him. And he can therefore not be some standard that you feel sort of weak before, but you can um, appreciate. Uh, you can uh, have him, in fact, kind of give you an education by following the sources he thought was important and then reading uh beyond i will say as a sort of uh a warning i do see sort of young people interested in nietzsche and you start to imitate him and i was like this myself one day i remember getting criticized for using the word verily in a paper uh, when, I, <laughs> when i was much younger and um it's easy to overreach yeah. and to arrive especially with nietzsche it's a very dangerous and and um volatile conclusions um, without having done your your homework. And I think Nietzsche um, should be read with that humility and with an eye towards self-education rather than presuming yourself to have risen too readily to his level, a level that we could, could, can't hope to reach mm. at such a young age, at least. That's a, that's a great point. And I want to pause on that for a second because the Nietzschean style not just the pro style but the uh style of thought the type of explosive insight um the deeply critical relationship to the things that he's talking about I think that that in a way is uh <clears throat> is much it's much easier to well it's obviously it's much easier to imitate than the knowledge which is much more difficult um, so I'm, maybe that's a moment to transition into starting to think a little bit about some of the legacies or influences of Nietzsche. This is something in a way we've already been, uh, been talking about, um, and we can come back and, and, uh, maybe fill out some of Nietzsche's, uh, elements of his critique of 
what we might call Western Civ by thinking about what some of his legacies are. Um, I had a, uh, or I have uh, a wonderful teacher, Carlos Ayer, uh, Reformation historian who's been on this podcast. Uh, and he used to quote this student of his uh, who said that uh, Erasmus laid the egg that Luther scrambled variation did Erasmus lay the egg that Luther hatched did Erasmus lay the egg that Luther scrambled um so I'm curious when it comes to the critique of Western Civ uh do you think it's fair to say that Nietzsche laid an egg of some kind that got either hatched or, or scrambled by later thinkers yeah, I think the obvious scrambler you can think of here is Martin Heidegger, right, mm -hmm. possibly. Or if you want to be even more uh, um, sort of uh, on the ground, obviously Adolf Hitler, right? Oh, wow. Is, okay. Uh, well, I mean, when you think of uh, – I'm assuming you mean they ruined the egg by scrambling. Yeah, I think so. Turned yeah. it into something so, else. Yeah, yeah, they turned it into something else, yeah. which is strange because scrambled eggs are better than raw eggs. But yeah, <laughs> some people online will debate that. But <laughs> but it, when you're thinking about who maybe misunderstood Nietzsche or um, or sort of confused his thought, yeah, um, there is a connection between Nietzsche and fascism. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I think uh, when Nietzsche talks about things like vitality. Mm. Um, he has in mind that we will exercise this more intellectually than politically, though it's, of course, not without its political effects. Um, but he thought he sought first and foremost, I think, a, a deepening of the German spirit or of German intellectual uh, life. And he's pretty clear that this requires a diversion from politics. And so Heidegger, I think, makes this mistake. He he turns too quickly and, and sees too much promise in national mm. uh, socialism. And in fact, uh, he himself engaged in a kind of self-critique in his lectures on Nietzsche from the 1930s. Uh, the first set in particular, the will to power uh, as, as work of art or will to power as art, um, is a uh, sort of profound self-critique uh, if, if it's read properly. Um, I mean, he sensed that that it's important, obviously, the will matters and that the will should somehow uh, triumph over its circumstances. And obviously, that kind of language makes you think of the Nazis, right, mm -hmm. and Heidegger's attraction to them. Um, but he also, I think, knew that for a genuinely lasting creation or a genuinely powerful willing, uh, great intellectual efforts would be necessary, not just by him, by but by future uh, thinkers. And it wouldn't happen without great care to German education. And um, and it's very clear that that concern was not enhanced by these scramblers, but rather hampered uh, by them. Um, and I think a more deserving heir to Nietzsche in this respect would be somebody like Leo Strauss, um, who I think continued the Nietzschean historiographical project while also critiquing Nietzsche himself and rereading the history of the West with, with the same eye to unearthing a kind of possibility of a new sort of vital or revived uh, thought, um, a possibility that could be old, it could be new, um, but the possibility of genuine reflection on the human good, the place of man in the world and, and in his, and his uh, communities, and what that sort of... Um, thought might look like in the wake of the collapse of modernity, which concerned both Nietzsche and Strauss. And so um, I don't know how you can do the metaphor, but maybe uh, Heidegger scrambled the egg and, and Strauss poached it. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. You know, scrambled egg, if you're baking a cake, scrambled eggs aren't what you want, right? That's true. Yeah. So maybe if you're, yeah, if you're, I'm not going to pursue that too much further, but something like that could work. Nietzsche is sometimes grouped in with Marx and Freud as practitioners of the so-called hermeneutics of suspicion, um, in that way seen as forerunners of some elements of modern critical theory. Uh, do you think that's a fair, or do you think there is a, a line 
of influence there from Nietzsche to uh, critical theory. And by critical theory, uh, we don't just mean thinking critically, but specific um, lines of intellectual thought like the Frankfurt School, kind of Marxist cultural critique, some kinds of feminism. Uh, what do you see as Nietzsche's contribution to that kind of thinking? Well, a lot of this stuff comes by way of Foucault, who um, saw the sort of um, the inadequacies of Marxism and and married it to something like a Nietzschean account of the will and mm. power. And the question, I think, always comes down with Nietzsche to whether the will to power as a sort of human uh, faculty or impulse or drive that creates the world after the image of the individual, right, and their particular constitution, whether that suffices to describe uh, all human phenomena. Certainly people like Foucault seem to think so, and they think that this suffices as a uh, destruction of metaphysics. Uh, I think uh, Foucault ends up lapsing into metaphysics unwittingly. If you pay attention to the premises of his thought, there is a kind of necessity governing the relationship between ideas uh, that he doesn't appreciate. And I think Nietzsche would have said the same thing. Um, I don't think he thinks that the will to power describes all phenomena. I think Socrates, for example, uh, resists this sort of uh, reduction. Um, one way to think about this, and this is maybe getting into some of your other questions, but Nietzsche looked at reason. There's a, a chapter in Twilight of the Idols called Reason and Philosophy, and reason in that title is in quotation marks or in scare quotes, as we would put it, right? Meaning it's not reason. Mm -hmm. And what he has in mind is that reason thinks it's contemplating the true world in separation from the apparent world in which we all live. It's getting behind appearances to reality. But in fact, this, this true world is a creation. It's just another apparent world. And so reason is in scare quotes because it isn't reason at all, right? This, this uh, move um, is not meant to just dismiss reason altogether, but it's meant to, he then poses at the end, well, what world is left? What world is left for me? If I if I collapse the true and apparent world, we just have the world. There is no apparent world. It's not got nothing it's opposed to anymore. And so he's trying to re-understand the world and re-understand reason in terms that are more genuinely rational, uh, you could say, that, that understand the constructive or fictive or creative elements of reason, the uh, while also trying to rescue something like uh, reason is contemplating. For the very obvious uh, um, problem uh, that Foucault and others encounter, which is that in reducing all thinking to making, they can't make sense of that very reduction, which claims to be true, right? He understands that. Nietzsche understands that and says, I need to try to find a way, if possible, outside of this problem that I've noticed that I think is to a great deal real um, and get back at, at a, a more genuine reason or a more um, genuine contemplation of the world, aware of this pitfall. Mm. Aware, just to clarify, aware of the pitfall of reason in what what respect exactly? Reason as, as making the world okay. after its own, uh, the image of the, the author. He gives the example of a guy named Cornaro, also a Todd of the Idols, who wrote a book on, on his sparse diet and how he lived. And, he, and he's just like, this book is crazy. <laughs> it would be a, a mistake for most people to follow this. In fact, mm -hmm. the book is just a reflection of, of Cornaro's own diet right and and his own constitution something like that happens in the works of philosophers which he calls in beyond good and evil an unwitting memoir mm. It, mm. you think it's about the world it's really about you it's your autobiography in a cleansed of proper names you could say yeah it reminds me of a uh, passage from william james pragmatism where he says 
uh, what each of the books of the philosophers pretends to be is a picture of the great universe of God, uh, what it is and uh, and oh so flagrantly is uh, a testimony of how strange the unique flavor of our fellow human beings really is. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. And Nietzsche's noticing something like that while noticing that as a total totalizing account, that's not adequate. It has yeah. to, it, if it's going to make sense, it has to create room for, I don't want to use the word the universal, but something for like, like reality. Hmm. Yeah. So maybe the more obvious account of Nietzsche would be that first kind of critique. That's the more familiar. That's what's more familiar to most of us. Um, how would that critique for Nietzsche work on someone like uh, Plato, for example? Is Plato a, a particular um, target of Nietzsche? Yes, I, th I think uh, um, more so than Socrates, he feels comfortable criticizing uh, um, Plato. Yeah. Though in many ways he recognizes his debt to Plato. Um, I mean, a lot of what I'm saying about about um reason as creative uh reminds me at least of plato's sophist mm. um where there's this character a stranger from the uh, italian uh, city of elia um and there he says uh we make different accounts about things and the stranger calls these accounts or these arguments spoken images Right. So he 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 makes reason a kind of adjective or, or I guess a, a participle. Um and the image is what's really going on there. And he says there's two kinds of images, those that distort reality and those that represent it accurately. And he then sets out on a very long and difficult attempt to separate the two, an attempt that I think it's questionable whether he actually succeeds, at least in that uh, dialogue, though it seems to be that he succeeds. Um, the stranger struggles, Nietzsche struggles, we all struggle with this very difficult um, uh, question. And and that that struggle, which we could say is the sort of second part of Nietzsche, though it's somewhat uh, coextensive with that first part um, is in a way the whole difficulty of of philosophy understanding to what extent your um, desire for truth or or your desire for the feeling of knowing let's say um, lives up to your actual desire for truth and and to what extent reality thwarts you know our attempt to give a final account of it hmm. yeah that's uh that's that's fascinating and so you you do see Nietzsche as having a considerable debt to Plato even while uh, he wants to um, while Plato is one of the objects of his ire or, or criticism um, what do you what do you think is the uh, core of Nietzsche's critique? of plato at, at at any particular time in his career even if he ends up renouncing it i mean yeah so to be a bit more i kind of danced away from the question you asked i think the point i was making more was that um nietzsche is part of a storied uh tradition and that yeah. what he's getting at is a very very familiar and one of the oldest problems in the history of philosophy as regards plato um this is where I think he um, comes up a little bit short. He's better on Socrates, oddly enough, though not 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 sort of I think ultimately adequate. This is one of the few places I feel comfortable uh, criticizing Nietzsche because I am a Plato scholar, so I feel like I have uh, some traction on on his reading, its grounds, and and certain problems with with it. I think he uh, takes Plato too much to be a moralizer. Um, uh, and too much to be a kind of proto-Christian. Uh, I think there are other traditions of Platonic interpretation, uh, um, not just sort of Neoplatonism that sort of gets merged with Christianity, um, but medieval Islamic interpretations and Jewish interpretations, which uh, found uh, in, say, Plato's laws, very different Plato 
from the Plato you find find in more putatively Christian texts mm. like the Phaedo, mm. uh, for example, or Timaeus. Um, and so I think I think one of the difficulties with Nietzsche, and what perhaps exposes a kind of uh, stereotypically modern ire against theology or Christianity, um, I think one of the difficulties is he he approaches the history of philosophy too much through the lens of Christianity. Not to say obviously it's quite important; <laughs> it's not one of the most important phenomena in, in human history, but. Uh, um, I do think there are other sort of lines of thought in Plato that are exposed. This also, I think, uh, goes hand in hand with another criticism. And here I'd be bringing in Strauss again. I'm just betraying my my own indebtedness to Strauss. But um, I think there's also a a, a limit uh, in uh, Nietzsche's appreciation of platonic irony or platonic rhetoric. What Farabi calls the way of Thrasymachus, his ability to speak to those who have mixed their interest in philosophy with um, a more primary interest in piety or or morality. Um, um, I think there are some very uh, powerful criticisms of, of this interpretation of Plato within Plato himself. Nietzsche takes this as an impossible mixture on Plato's part, but I, I take Plato to be much more in control uh, of this and i think it's quite clear in dialogues like the republic that morality is confined to the cave and that the concern with the good and knowledge of the good is is the properly philosophic endeavor the good understood not in a morally formative politically edifying way or certainly not in a religious way but in somehow uh, otherwise um are there any other uh major thinkers that uh, Nietzsche critiques that you find the criticisms either interesting because they're valid or suggestive or interesting because they maybe fall a little short of the mark. Yeah, I mean, his, his critiques of Christianity are pretty powerful, though I think they ultimately are of a sort of certain strand of Christianity. And uh, I'm not a Christian myself, and I don't know uh, the texts and the sex and all the, you know, even the possibilities for individual Christians, <laughs> obviously. But um, I think there are some powerful arguments there that are worth uh, taking uh, seriously. Um, I think he's a little hard on Kant, um, though perhaps I think he he might be deeper than than Kant. Uh, it strikes me that. Um, uh, sort of uh, on Nietzsche's reading, Kant doesn't fully understand his the implications of his critique of of trying to know the thing in itself, and you know, you know, Kant is aware of something like culture and creating culture and developing it, um, but I think Nietzsche um, sees that there's kind of radical new possibilities uh, open uh, as a result of that. Um, his. Uh, uh, his critiques of of um i mean he's very much concerned with a sort of high-minded uh idealism uh and so he always has plato and christianity in his targets um but his most powerful part of his thinking is probably his psychologizing i mean it's pretty amazing <laughs> what he does with people and the greatest philosophers i think are are amazing psychologist. Uh, Socrates is obviously like this. And Nietzsche shares this with Socrates, uh, though he emphasizes it far more, I think precisely because philosophy has gotten too impersonal uh, and he wants to ground it in the personal, in the sort of psychological effects. But his psychological critiques of different literary figures um, philosophers like Rousseau, for example, are very powerful and intriguing and teach you to think. Uh, um, a lot better. And so, uh, yeah, there's many aspects and many criticisms that I think are, are, are well worth pursuing. It starts to seem like he has, uh, like you said, a, a, a sort of a target that has certain stereotyped features. Um, extremely moral, uh, idealistically moral, abstracted from uh, 
particular circumstances or even from material circumstances from the body, uh, Kant, Plato, Socrates, uh, these start to look, Jesus, maybe, they, these start to look like they're of a certain type, um, as opposed to, um, well, the philosophers that he likes are a little hard to come by, but there there are some, <laughs> uh, but there are certainly literary figures and so on, Goethe and so on. Yeah, he, I mean, he likes Lessing and likes Machiavelli. He likes Aristophanes. Um, I mean, Lessing is a fantastic uh, figure. He mentions you know, his free spiritedness or Freigeisterei in chapter two of Beyond Good and Evil. And this is a reference to a play um, uh, Lessing wrote called uh, The Freie Geist. And it's about a very Nietzschean figure who, and a Christian figure. And it's a comedy, a romantic comedy, where uh, there each one is in love with a woman, apparently of her type, and then they end up falling in love with the the woman of the other type. It's a bit like I spend many years, a bit like Fathers and Sons, if that's the the book. I, if I'm not mixing, anyways, that aside, um, and it's very revealing of Nietzsche's intentions. That you read this play, and then you read Nietzsche, and you're like wait a second, it seems like he's suggesting that some of the sort of philosophic possibilities he's holding out or hopes are nascently Christian, right? Mm. If this Nietzschean figure becomes Christian in this play and he's referring to it, it, it's so there's a kind of coyness in Nietzsche that um, is well represented by more literary and comedic uh, authors like Aristophanes, Machiavelli, and Lessing that should be appreciated. He seems so serious, but he's obviously irreverent. He's obviously playful. Um, he has this very like serious concern uh, about you know the state of education in Germany and and of Western civilization as a whole, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there's also a kind of playful thing he does with his his readers as well. So is Nietzsche funny in your opinion? At times, if you like mean spirited humor, which I do, um, <laughs> you could be extremely funny i mean some of the uh insults he drops they're very nerdy uh insults but they're uh um yeah they, i mean they're there are some pretty pretty cutting remarks at, at times and sort of but he often laughs at, at himself i mean he has a section toilet of the toilet of the idols where um he's attacking um um he's attacking a sort of philosophic concept that seems uh, um, Christian. And then he ends up linking linking it with certain ideas he's proposed. And he's like, yeah, I guess I'm sort of similar in a certain way, right? So he turns it on himself uh, hmm. quite a bit. Um, he often talks about mistakes he's made with humor about himself. And and uh, um, everybody points to at Jehomo and how he says, you know, why I'm so wise, why I'm a destiny, destiny why I write such uh, good books. <laughs> but he also, I mean, he had to understand that with a sense of humor. And he also sort of makes playful remarks about himself. So. Did you ever hear the uh, Mel Brooks joke? Uh, what is the opposite of comedy? Germany. <laughs> so it's something to be said about that. But yeah, I don't but, know. Nietzsche, yeah. I think Nietzsche, Nietzsche's, uh, um, I mean, there's some truth to that, but Nietzsche, I think, escapes it. Um, so. You teach in, or you're a faculty fellow in the Benson Center for uh, Study of Western Civilization. Um, how do we assess Nietzsche's relationship to Western civilization as a tradition, as a concept, um, as a historical reality? Is is Nietzsche good for Western civilization or bad for Western civilization? I mean, it depends what one means by Western civilization. If we mean sort of keeping up the the sort of old uh, traditions, then yeah, he's probably bad. But there's another understanding of Western civilization that sees it as full of internal factions. This is one of the problems with people who say, oh, this is just Western thought. It's all just dead white men and, or, you know, get rid of it all. And, yeah. And, um, but... That's really deceptive. Um, Western thought is constituted by uh, internal critique and uh, debate. In fact, you could say the twin pillars of Western thought are sort of 
Plato and the Bible, right? And reason and revelation. And that is itself the most fundamental debate from which stem many others. And and, and each one has its own internal uh, factions. I mean, just the example I gave of Plato's Sophist shows how Plato is, uh, Nietzsche is part of this ancient tradition of critiquing our understanding of uh, the world. And so you could say his attempt to reduce reason to creativity uh, or to observe how wrongheaded is, is on the one hand, quite destructive. Yeah, everybody's an unwilling creator, you know, and then you thumb your nose at him and, and off you go. But it's also quite constructive because he never loses sight of the fact um, that he wants still to try to rescue reason or, or to f revive Western rationalism. One way I'll I'll put this question is is, um, insofar as the West found itself in crisis before Nietzsche and still finds itself in crisis, um, can Western civilization do without Nietzsche? I think would be the the question. I mean, who better diagnosed uh, the ailments of the West in late modernity? Um, who was more prophetic? in other words, for our times that we're living in now. Is there a better image or a more memorable image of our shallowness than Nietzsche's description, just a page or so in Nietzsche, of the last man, or a more powerful statement of what we long for when we're honest about our dissatisfaction than the image of the ubermensch, the superman or the overman? Um I think when you think about the current state of the West and its apparent loss of vitality or lack of direction, I think Nietzsche ends up ends up doing a great service uh, to the West, right? Um, the I think it would be very hard to point to Nietzsche and blame him for the erosion of liberal education and the erosion mm -hmm. of uh, uh, religion. Um, as I said a little earlier. Uh, um, he might further it, and he might give good grounds for it, um, but he also gives uh, good grounds for taking it quite seriously, right? Um, where, uh, I mean, in a way, none of us, none of the contemporary critics of religion rise to the level of a Nietzsche or a Spinoza or a Hobbes or any other sort of critic of religion who knew it quite well. Right and who who clearly have thought about it a great deal philologically uh, even mm. um, I think it would be very hard to blame Nietzsche for that though it, it would be I think foolish of me to deny that there's fuel for the fire um, there but for a lazy reader obviously lazy conclusions for a serious reader I do think you really need to take him uh, seriously and it's partly for this reason that part of what i'm doing as a faculty fellow at the benzen center is with my colleague paul de duke uh, putting on a uh, seminar on nietzsche in the spring we're inviting a number of notable scholars of nietzsche's thought to talk about uh nietzsche and the fate of western civilization so mm. which i'm looking forward very much and that'll be on uh youtube and everything oh that sounds great yeah, yeah. you'll have to send that to me when that's uh when that's oh. up i'm sure yeah, some podcast listeners would like to to hear that. I know I would. Yeah, yeah. Um. So now that we're talking a little bit about Nietzsche and what Nietzsche can show us about the present, um, I'm curious how it is that that you came to the study of Nietzsche. Um, Nietzsche is obviously a part of any education in philosophy, especially, um, well, I was going to say especially political philosophy, but maybe just especially uh, all kinds of philosophy today, um, maybe none in a special. Uh, how is it that, that you developed a serious interest in Nietzsche as either a supplement or an addition or something else to your to your sort of first love of uh, Greek philosophy, especially Plato. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually came to Nietzsche first. Uh, when I was uh, an undergraduate, I was very, uh, I was studying physiology and neurobiology. I was very dissatisfied. And so like all depressed young people, I started reading Dostoevsky 
And uh, I read quite a bit of him. I, I read as much of him as I, I could. And uh, as I read about him, and, you know, you read footnotes and things, uh, this guy's name kept coming up, Nietzsche. Yeah. <laughs> Nietzsche. Nietzsche. And so I thought I should probably check him out. And, and so I picked up a copy of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a pretty good place to start, I would say. Yeah, it was. And I still have my portable Nietzsche, which has it. It's now split in uh, two. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, um, I just started reading it and I, I read all the different excerpts and I like the little uh, separate aphorisms and I, I found it very interesting. And, um, uh, and that's when I started taking philosophy courses so i'd already read quite a bit of mm -hmm. of him before then mm -hmm. and i was attracted to there was one particular passage in zarathustra on uh, it's called the leech but it's really about a leech brain excerpt expert who looks at the whole world not through the leech's eyes the, the eyes of the leech brain and it's very funny because it's called the leech but it's the leech is the guy it's not the, the actual leech that he's sort of buried in and uh, it's a very fitting image because he himself has a leech brain his brain leeches on things sucks the blood and life out of them and and kills them and as i sat in my lab practicals identifying crevices on bones i said this is how I'm understanding human beings. I'm sucking the life out of them. And it was a powerful one page, really just a little image that stuck with me and convinced me this is not the life I should live. And so I started taking philosophy and, and I found my way to Plato. And I found in Plato um, the same sort of brilliance and psychologizing, but um, a kind of depth of details and nuance that even as nuanced a thinker as Nietzsche uh, struggles uh, to approach. And uh, um, since then, I, I find it hard to justify myself to myself reading somebody aside from, from Plato. Um, yeah. But Nietzsche was a, was a pivotal for me. I would never have gotten interested, I think in, in philosophy had I not encountered him via Dostoevsky. I might've just stayed depressed reading Russian literature for the rest of my life. Who do you think has the, uh, deeper insight into psychology plato or nietzsche plato i mean i mean it's it's pretty close but plato um he understands the way in which our most um sort of common longings and sort of pre-philosophic longings worm their way into arguments mm -hmm. and 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 very it's very precise beliefs and he um, can show you the relationship between those two in a way that no other author, I think, can do. Um, to a degree that you find yourself connecting uh, beliefs and, and sort of um, uh, claims that are made to uh, parts of ourselves uh, that we never would have guessed. Um, Nietzsche is very, very good at giving you a totalizing picture of a thinker's thought and sort of saying, this is what this person's really doing. And like his criticisms of, of Kant as just worming his way back to Christian morality through this, this perversely overly elaborate intellectual apparatus. I think he doesn't give Kant enough credit for being in control of this, but criticism like that is like, wow, he just summed up all of Kant in like, a few sentences that's pretty mm. powerful he's really good at that and and plato does that too but for the very precise nuanced details of how um, a, a soul will exhibit its nuances over a very subtle and and very complex and sometimes very long argument um is just fantastic i mean there's mm. few people who can do that i think mm. Mm. you know one of the things that as a non-philosopher sometimes you observe in the philosophic type would is a certain um uh computerized intellect or quality of being a brain on a stick uh and that certainly doesn't seem to apply to either Nietzsche or Plato they seem very much very emotional spiritual people 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I want to agree. Yes, and no. I mean, they can understand an emotion and and a um and a hope and a desire. All these apparently somehow they can understand it from the inside. I mean, really well. On the one hand, on the other hand, Socrates is somehow the most unique character in the history of philosophy or in, in all literature, actually, I, sh- I should say, because he is something like pure thought mm. that when put into a kind of situation also uh, understands, um, uh, uh, has this psychological element. Um, the way this is put, Seth Benedetti, one of my favorite I mean, probably my favorite scholar of 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 uh, Plato mm. um, has this remark where Socrates in the beginning of the Sophist says, sometimes philosophers are confused with Sophists, sometimes with statesmen. And, uh, and Benedetti sort of takes this to mean uh, that there's Socrates, the moralist, and Socrates, the logic chopper. And mm-hmm. somehow the these need to be put together through a kind of psychological uh, understanding of 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 Socratic philosophy, this ability to work your way into our sort of moral longings and and our sort of uh, sub rational longings on the one hand, while also pairing that together with this uh, destructive reason in a way that tears things down and finds problems. Somehow putting these together gives you this archetype of human being and so on the one hand i want to say they, they do live in a way kind of passionate lives they can understand love in a very very inside way while also submitting it to this sort of brain on a stick critique if you want to put it that way i i mean no 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 harm against any any <laughs> any philosophers maybe um yeah maybe maybe i'm actually responding to how even my own mind works when you get into this mode where uh everything becomes uh reduced to you know the pure uh intellectual game of almost moving mental chess pieces around um but i i find plato uh Plato very powerful because, well, on the one hand, he's not a he's not an emotional writer. I mean, there are some very beautiful passages from Plato, but he really does seem like he is after uh, the truth or what is rationally expressible. Um, but he seems to know the human heart, and that's a that's a powerful combination, I think. Yeah. There are these moments in in Plato where Socrates will just give this really eloquent statement about a problem or or a feeling like a dissatisfaction in the Republic. Uh, or, I mean, in the symposium, the depiction of Eros um, mm-hmm. climbing this sort of a ladder of beauties up to the beautiful itself, and the longing for um, to leave something behind that looks like uh, you. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some touching moments. Socrates consoling his friends in the Phaedo, playing with uh, uh, Phaedo's hair. I mean, it's pretty um, touching moments. And he understands them from the inside. But the the one way to put this is with the example of Socrates is in the Carmides. Um, Carmides comes in and he's said to be so beautiful that everybody's eyes turn towards him, even the youngest. And they're just raptured in love with him. Um, and you think that that includes Socrates, but then you realize, no, Socrates could not be looking at the others if he were looking at Carmides. So somehow uh, he puts this sort of, he's somehow de- detached from the beauty of Car- Carmides, but extremely capable of understanding it um, and why it's so powerful and what that that means and being able to speak uh, um, to it. Um mm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very difficult. In a way, this is the problem of thinking, right? It's very difficult when you're taking an opinion seriously or a hope that we might have uh, seriously. It's very difficult to take it seriously and not fall prey to it, right? Um, you have to hold out the possibility that this is true and that it's true in the way that speaks to our deepest long on the one hand on the other hand you then have to be able to separate yourself from it and submit it to critique 
And if you separate yourself from it too easily, there's a chance that your critique isn't adequate to the thing you're critiquing on the one hand. On the other hand, if you get too much inside of it, you might never come back out again. You might fall prey to the charm, right? Um, uh, Plato's ability to do that shows this sort of philosophical adeptness of being able to step inside the opinions of others while also submitting. And, and the way in which this shows up in a manifest way in Plato is when you look at his depictions of the characters, they're really human. They're really relatable. You can think of people like this. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, he's then able to sort of tear him to pieces. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's a rare, rare ability. Um, that sort of mm -hmm. philosophic ability to um, push an opinion to its sort of highest defense and then still look at it with a critical eye. Mm -hmm. It's almost Shakespearean. Uh, Shakespeare is another great example of yeah. this where he's, I think maybe in many ways more psychologically adept than Nietzsche, but he can, he also does something Plato does where he connects a kind of common passion to very particular opinions that uh, a person might have. About. And so you'll start to see connections that you never would have seen uh, before that are, that are, um, that are, that are quite revealing, right. Of, of you don't get the sort of logic chopping, obviously, though there's something of that in the drama, but you do sometimes see a character say something offhand. You say, Oh my gosh, wait, that offhanded remark that weird thing they did, they had to do it because of this belief that they have or this mm. commitment that they have. And you start to realize that these things are often more connected than you would uh, initially mm. take them to be. Who do you think uh, teaches better in your experience? Does Nietzsche teach better or does Plato teach better? I mean, Nietzsche's, this is a hard question because Nietzsche's in a way... Uh, more seductive and sort of bombastic, but he also is, he he talks so much about other um, mm. authors that and that they haven't read, right? right. Many of which no, we haven't read, but certainly they haven't read Kant and Plato, because he's ultimately involved in something like historiography, right? Uh, sort of critical historiography, um, and so Plato might be better from that standpoint. On the other hand, there are works of Nietzsche that are do lend themselves to the classroom. And so um, I really like Twilight of the Idols. There are a lot of references to historical figures, uh, but they're largely contained to this very uh, uh, long section called Raids of an Untimely Man. And you can kind of cherry pick important sections from that when teaching it. Um, Prior to that, and then after that, there are some very sort of clear statements on a kind of totalizing or sort of more general level about uh, what he's trying to do. And so um, you can kind of teach that book, starting with the critique of Socrates, but also reason and philosophy as sort of, how do we escape this creeping feeling Um that there is, uh, um, we can't give a true account of the world, that it's all just us making things up. How do we escape it while also giving it its due, due merits, right, as, as a claim? And, and, uh, and, and then also trying to think about what it would look like to both understand the world or strive to understand the world while creating uh, a sort of great accounts of it. Right. And, and Nietzsche, so Nietzsche ends with an account of the aphorism. And so I think it can lead to a very rewarding. I taught a course on Twilight of the Idols once, mm -hmm. not 80% of it was Twilight of the Idols. And it was a great course. And so if anybody out there is thinking of teaching Nietzsche, that would be a good one. Um, Zarathustra is also pretty good, though the imagery is so difficult as to be uh, taxing. But again, it, it, you know, avoids any any real sort of engagement with particular thinkers. I mean, Jesus is mentioned, and like the Greeks and the Persians are, are mentioned. But uh, aside from that, it's mostly imagery, and a lot of it is drawing on 
on uh, historical stuff, but you can also just ca cast it as what it is, as sort of human possibilities, right? And mm -hmm. different views of the world. And and that might be Orga's teaching, though I've never done more than the prologue and a few introductory sections when, when teaching it. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that a lot of uh, Zarathustra familiarity with the Bible would be helpful, but I'm not sure how many of our students that is an advantage for today. Um, yeah, it's not it's not there. Um, um, but you can, I mean, I, I often have to do this in class. You can offer them a kind of sort of, I don't know, crib sheet on on you know yeah. Christianity, afterlife, right? right? Mortality of the soul, sin, love man for God's sake. Okay, you got it. Now we have this. Why does he not like that? And you can kind of work from there for the purposes of undergrads. Mm -hmm. So um, as we begin to wind things down to a close, um, I uh, I didn't prepare you for this, but because I know that your book just uh, came out or is coming out right now, I wondered if you might want to say something about your book. Yeah, so I had two books come out this year. One just came out in August, uh, a short book on Plato's Symposium, musings on Plato's Symposium. If you're interested in Nietzsche, it is rather aphoristic, so it might be, though it's it's not, you know, on that level at all, and it's and it's uh, um, really focused on the symposium in in particular. The other book, which is a bit more scholarly in style. Um, uh, though it is related is on Plato's trilogy on the question of knowledge, uh, this Theotetus sophist and statesman. And, um, but I see it as offering a kind of scientific alternative to Socratic uh, philosophy or the attempt to arrive at one and failing mm -hmm. specifically in the attempt to uh, discern uh, the truth in abstraction from uh, the good. Whereas for Socrates, the question of the good is always sort of orienting us, the question of our good and, and uh, um, related issues of how, how, whether the, you know, our opinions about the good can be satisfied by the world. So it quickly turns into an account of, of being. Um, but I kind of, I try to situate that meditation in relation, Plato's meditation in relation to the modern uh, attempt to depart from uh, questions of the good um, and to focus on questions of efficient causality, uh, you could say, but the attempt to look at the true and abstraction from the good and take the good in a way as given. Um, as, and so um, uh, the introduction contains a kind of critique and I return to it at times uh, in the book itself, but um, it's about a, a trilogy of dialogues on the question of knowledge and they're very difficult dialogues. And so if you haven't read the Theotius, Sophists and Statesmen, um, uh, or you, you don't plan on reading and working through that trilogy in any sort of totalizing way, I do recommend, it's not, I don't recommend the book. I, I hate to get people to buy my book and then they realize, oh my God, this is not what I signed up for. I think if you like reading Plato and if you've read the symposium, Musings on Plato's Symposium is, is uh, more for a general audience. Um, and I, and I, I think people will like that as well, but those are the two things I big things I had come out this good. year. That's no, that's great. And uh, I was going to say those are diff one of those is particularly difficult, but they're all difficult. <laughs> uh, Sophist is very difficult, in my opinion. Yeah, it's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, I was just reading this morning uh, the Euthyphro. I just happened to find uh, one of my. <laughs> Plato's on uh, on the shelf this morning. I was like, I could read some of the Euthyphro. And when you were talking about the particular types, uh, kind of figures that there are in Plato and how arguments are married to the psychological passion, uh, Euthyphro himself, um, he seems utterly bizarre and yet also sort of plausible as a kind of... Uh, well, what's the best way to half crazed zealot? Um, yeah, he's he's a kind of uh, he's a kind of Greek Protestant. Yeah, say. yeah, something. He's like a but Puritan. In, not, I don't want to. I don't mean to malign Protestants by saying uh, crazed zealot, but there is an, an attempt to correct for perceived deficiencies in the canonical um, religion through a novel interpretation, uh, mm. um, and this, you know. Uh, the possibility of this leading one astray. Yeah. 
yeah. Uh, what Alex is referring to, if you if you don't know, Euthyphro is prosecuting his father for having murdered, in quotation marks, a hired man who killed one of his father's slaves. And Euthyphro is doing this because he believes that he knows what is proper piety and that, uh, you know, we must always punish, even if it's your own father, you must always do this. And he's a, he's a prophesier as well. He goes into the ecclesia, a kind of uh, giant uh, every man Congress of the Athenians and, uh, and prophesies for them there. Yeah. He, he is kind of a, um, there's a character from, uh, um, uh, Bartholomew Fair, that's, uh, uh, what's his name? Zeal of the Land Busy is the character's name. He's a kind of Puritan, um, uh, killjoy, let's say. Uh, but Euthyphro is a step beyond a killjoy. He's into, yeah, he's a step beyond that. Yeah, I mean, Socrates swears by Zeus twice um, early in the dialogue. One is at the fact that he's prosecuting his father, and this is completely unorthodox. The other, that despite this unorthodoxy, he still believes in the stories told by the poets. And so there's something very, very odd about this guy who has... And Socrates kind of goes from uninterested in him to interested, I think, as he hears more because he realizes like, oh, this guy is uh, somewhat interesting. I mean, crazy, but it's interesting when odd. Uh, you could say Plato is full of oddballs, young people and oddballs, but Euthyphro is one of the oddballs. Hippias, Protagoras, Gorgias, these are all oddballs and, and uh, Nicias uh, even. Um, but um and then young people that he's sort of interested in. But there's something interesting about these oddballs who feel compelled by prevailing accounts or by prevailing sort of teachings to go in a new direction, even though it's crazy. They might have noticed something mm. and then mm. taken a weird turn in the wrong direction. Mm. Uh, um, and that there's something worth, uh, there might be something worth noticing there. And I think Euthyphro does sort of... Uh, this is a very difficult question to, to get into, but I do think he notices something that mm. Socrates thinks is is pretty noteworthy. Mm. Mm. Interesting. So as uh, when I return to Euthyphro, I should pay attention to what it is that Socrates might actually respect or find interesting about him. Yeah. I, um, I mean, respect might be a little bit too, too um, high of a word Though, I mean, even the most laughable characters have something interesting about them. So maybe respect is, isn't a bad word, but there's certainly uh, there's certainly something worth thinking about very seriously in, in Euthyphro. And you could say it's it comes back to this very, very serious question of why do people think orthodoxy isn't enough? Why do we even need to call it orthodoxy, right? As in opposed to sort of, uh, anorthodoxy. I don't know even what the uh, cacodoxy or something like that, but whatever uh, the deviations from orthodoxy arise from within orthodoxy, and it could just be a perversion of the mind, obviously, um, but one should look into these things. And I think mm. uh, the fact that even somebody as silly as Euthyphro seems to have something interesting that he's on to is, is mm. worth thinking about. Final question now. Do you have a uh, favorite platonic oddball a favorite oddball yeah oh that's also interesting uh i mean lately i've been working on the republic a lot and um and glaucon's absolutely fascinating uh but i've i've i feel like i folk glaucon's so much a central figure that in my efforts to understand him i had only achieved a, a really partial account of Idamantus. And I feel like just now, this time through, he's really fallen together. And there's something uh, relatable about Idamantus, maybe because I teach engineering students and like engineering students, Idamantus has a tendency to withdraw from the chaos of 
of democratic political life and say, I don't want any of that. I feel like it's just ruining a good thing. And, and uh, there's a kind of familiarity for my students in him. And so I, I feel compelled to understand him a bit better, but um, yeah, lately I've been sort of just thinking a lot about Idamantus and why. That's great. That's Plato's brother, correct? Yeah. Glaucon and Idamantus are, are two of Plato's brothers. Yes. Right? They're both, they're both. Yeah. Well, thank you, Alex. This has been a tremendous pleasure and uh uh, very, very illuminating for me. I've taken down notes of things that I look forward to going and reading. Well, thanks for having me. And, and it was a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, um, uh, very happy to, to meet you and, and, uh, and I'm um, happy for your podcast. It's great. All right. Thanks, Alex.